In the late 80s, as explained in the previous episode, the only available drug was AZT or Zidovide. But it was a double-edged sword, offering hope and side effects that could be just as devastating as the disease. Life with HIV was a roller coaster, a balancing act between hope and despair. But the fight was far from over. Scientists were racing against time, working tirelessly to develop more treatments. The next breakthrough came in 1991 with the approval of didenosine or DDI. This drug, like AZT, was a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It worked by blocking an enzyme that HIV virus needed to make copies of itself. Unfortunately, like AZT, DDI had its own set of side effects, including pancreatitis, which is inflammation of your pancreas, and peripheral neuropathy, which means some level of nerve damage. Meanwhile, as the scientific community worked to develop these new drugs, a different kind of revolution was taking place on the ground. People living with HIV, unsatisfied and desperate for effective treatments, took matters in their own hands. They formed Buyers Club, underground networks to import experimental HIV drugs from other countries or those not yet approved by the FDA. One of the most notable was the Dallas Buyers Club, led by Ron Woodruff, a man living with HIV. His story was immortalized in the movie Dallas Buyers Club. Woodruff, once a small-time electrician, became a beacon of hope for many living with HIV. The drugs they imported varied. Some were antivirals from countries like Mexico or Japan, like ribavirin and peptide T. Others were nutritional supplements believed to boost the immune system. But all of them represented hope and a chance at life when options seemed limited. It's important to note that these clubs weren't charity organizations. They charged fees, often hundreds of dollars a month. Yet for many, it was a price they were willing to pay for a glimmer of hope. The success of these clubs is hard to quantify. They undoubtedly gave hope and a sense of agency to people living with HIV. They also put pressure on the FDA and pharmaceutical companies to speed up the drug testing and approval processes. But they were also fraught with challenges. They operated in a legal grey area, often tangling with the FDA over the importation of unapproved drugs. Quality control was a significant issue. These were not FDA-approved treatments, and their effectiveness varied. The clubs faced criticism for exploiting vulnerable people's desperation, but to many living with HIV, they were a necessary response to a desperate situation. Then, in 1992, saw the approval of another drug called Zalcitabine or DDC. Again, it worked similarly to AZT and DDI, but had a unique side effect profile, including peripheral neuropathy and mouth ulcers. But the quest for better and more effective drugs continued. Then came protease inhibitors in 1995. Sequinovir was the first, a new class of the drugs that gave a glimmer of hope. It worked differently from the previous drugs, attacking a later stage in the virus's replication process. But like its predecessors, it wasn't without side effects. Diarrhea, stomach discomfort, and fat redistribution were common, and the larger number of pills required made adherence a huge challenge. Then, in 1996, the results of a study were published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that HIV could be controlled for the first time. The study, called ACTG320, changed the landscape of the treatment dramatically with the introduction of combination therapy 
also known as highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART. This wasn't a new drug, but rather a new strategy. Three drugs given together and attacking the virus at different stages of its life cycle. This approach proved to be revolutionary and transformed HIV from a death sentence to a manageable chronic condition. HARD became a gold standard and still continues to be the gold standard for treatment of HIV globally. But as we'll soon discover, this groundbreaking development was just the beginning of a new chapter, one that unfolded very differently, depending on where in the world you happened to live. You see, while HARD was a game changer, it came with a hefty price tag. The very people who needed it the most, those in developing countries where HIV and AIDS were spreading rapidly, were often the ones who could least afford it. And so, a new battle began, a war between the pharmaceutical companies who held the patents to these life-saving drugs and the people living with HIV who were fighting for their right to access them. Join us next time as we delve into this contentious chapter in the history of HIV and AIDS. Thanks for tuning in everyone. Please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Together, let's build a world where sex education is a human right.